Good evening. In the name of the Creator and the spirit of our ancestors, I'd like to greet everyone to another edition of the Department of Africana Studies Freedom School series, uh, co-sponsored with the Auburn Avenue Research Library. And I have the honor of moderating as well as introducing our presenter for the night, uh, Dr. Sarita K. Davis. Uh, Sarita Kaya Davis, for those who don't know. And just to introduce her, she's an associate professor in the Department of Africana Studies at Georgia State University, where she also directed the master's program in Africana Studies from 2008 to 2021. She is also an affiliate faculty in the School of Public Health. She earned her bachelor's degree in criminal justice from California State College Bakersfield, now California State University in Bakersfield, a master's degree in social work from University of California, Los Angeles, and a doctorate in program evaluation from Cornell University. Sarita served on local and international boards, including Aid Atlanta, the American Evaluation Association, the, and the National Council of Black Studies. She is a native of Los Angeles, California, West Side. <laughs> Currently lives in the suburb in a suburb of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Sarita conducted has conducted culturally responsive program evaluation in marginalized communities for almost three decades. The content of her evaluation work includes, but is not limited to, biomedical education, environmental health, faith-based initiatives, foster care, mental health, public health, and HIV prevention education. Her most recent body of research focuses on HIV risks and sexual communication between mothers who survive childhood sexual abuse and their daughters. Her theoretical emphasis is on womanism and the intersectional effects of race, class, and gender on sexual health outcomes amongst Black women, among Black women, I should say. She has published articles and book chapters on the topic, topics related to HIV prevention, education, and culturally responsive evaluation in the fields of Africana studies, anthropology, education, evaluation, mental health, public health, and social work. Most recently, she has a forthcoming co-edited book entitled Black Women and Public Health, Strategies to Name, Locate, and Change Systems. And that the topic for this evening, Dr. Davis, uh, she will have a conversation that will focus on HIV and Black women and the impetus of her forthcoming co-edited book. Uh, again, Black Women in Public Health, Strategies to Name, Locate, and Change Systems. And she will uh, talk about how it say, serves as a foundation for her research on decolonizing the Black female body. So without any further ado, I turn it over to my colleague, um, my sister in struggle, Sarita Kaya Davis. Thank you so much, Dr. Emoja. Your introductions are always so wonderful. I wish I could take you everywhere with me and just say, hey, let him introduce me. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm just going to I'm going to start the uh, PowerPoint. Um, and let's see. There we go. Okay. So um, the title of, of my talk is Decolonizing the Black Body, Getting to Self-Determination. Um, what the presentation is going to uh, cover is an examination of the literature 
this to the side. Well, I guess I can't. Um, an examination of the literature and national and local statistics on HIV and um, on Black women here in the United States. I'm also going to highlight uh, social determinants of health, risk factors, leading causes of morbidity and mortality, as well as particularly historical and cultural issues pertaining to HIV. And finally, I'll conclude with some recommendations for practice policy and education specific to um, Black women and girls. So um, Blacks and HIV, um, we are Black men and women, we are disproportionately impacted by the HIV epidemic. Um, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, almost half of the estimated 1.1 million people living with AIDS are Black. Um, also, Black women represent 61% of uh, new HIV diagnoses here in the United States. And um, also, Black trans women uh, account for a high percentage of HIV diagnosis, almost 84%. So here we have a map. Um, this is generated from um, a database uh, called AIDS, AIDS View, which is out of Emory uh, University here in Georgia. And basically the darker the color, the more concentrated the uh, prevalence of, of HIV in the area. And so what you, you see here is the South is disproportionately affected by HIV compared to the rest of the country. Um, let's see, I can, can't minimize that. Uh, can I minimize, no, because um, you can't see the other one. So this data also um, generated from AIDS view gives you a, a graphic image of how black Americans are represented. And as you see, um, even though we're 19% of the Southern population, um, we represent half of the new HIV diagnosis in the South. Uh, so here's some more background on the South. Um, as I said earlier, the South bears the greatest burden when it comes to HIV. Um, also again, according to CDC uh, in the South, 50. 2% of new infections are in the South. 44% uh, of all people living with HIV are in the South. And 47% of the people who uh, with HIV have died. So as you can see, the South really is far behind the rest of the country um, in terms of providing quality HIV prevention and care to residents um, and there are broader issues that affect the spread of the virus, including poverty, healthcare, uh, structural issues, homophobia, transphobia. This map um, uh, is specific to Atlanta. So the darker the, darker the color you see, um, the, again, the greater the prevalence of, of HIV. And right there in the center where it looks purple is, um, uh, is downtown Atlanta. Um, most of the affected areas are right around Georgia State University where we work. So let's take a look at the impact specifically of HIV on black women. Again, data from the Centers for for disease control and prevention, um, looking specifically at women and how we are disproportionately affected. Um, black women have the highest incidence of rate of HIV of all women. We are 15 times greater, um, uh, 15 times more likely to have HIV, uh, or we get HIV at 15 times greater the rate than our white counterparts. Uh, when it comes to young Black women, ages 13 to 24, they compromise 14% of newly diagnosed cases annually, and 44% uh, 
uh, black transgendered women are estimated to have HIV. That's almost half. So when we look at the literature on risk factors, um, black women remain at high risk of contracting HIV due to complex um, issues, social issues, psychological issues, economic, structural, environmental, interpersonal issues. Um, and these risk factors range from individual to systemic levels. So um, Cynthia Prather, uh, who is a researcher at CDC um, in the Division of HIV and AIDS, um, has written extensively on how racism plays a role in, uh, in Black women contracting HIV. Uh, Jones and Shorter, Jones, Shorter, and slash Gooden talk about the presence of negative stereotypes. So for example, there is research that suggests that not only do people in the medical field, uh, based on some surveys, um, have negative stereotypes of about black women. And um, Jones and Shorter in their research, they, they wrote a book in 2003 called Shifting. And they talk about, they surveyed hundreds of black women about their perceptions of themselves, how they think medical providers see them. And 96% of them felt that they are perceived negatively. Um, so um, Collins talks about how all of this affects stigma and discrimination, how we seek out healthcare. Um, uh, another important one, respectability politics. Um, Higginbotham in 94 talked about the presence of this and it's underscored in uh, Melissa Harris Perry's book, uh, Sister Citizen. And the issue of respectability politics um, is really important because that's something that is internal to the black community. So there was a time in coming out of, out of enslavement and when we were migrating North and West, um, there was this idea that if black women held themselves to a high standard in terms of dress and um, how they carried themselves, that they would not be they would not be affected by some of the, um, uh, the negative things that were happening, such as rape, um, being treated poorly in public and things like that. Um, but some have challenged this issue of respectability politics in, in saying that because the standard was so high, it eliminated black women from having honest conversations about sex and sexuality because supposedly if you are a good christian woman you won't be talking about these things so that has implications for parent child sexual communication um there's also extensive research on bias in the medical community and medical mistrust um harriet washington wrote an extensive book called medical apartheid where she goes into this in depthly. Um, other issues related to systemic uh, treatment is delayed HIV testing and enrollment into care. Uh, policies that um, policies and practices on the book. So, for example, one of the things that I am um, starting to examine in my research is um, how laws and ordinances here in Georgia, particularly Atlanta, having to, laws and ordinances that um, affected how black women's bodies were treated. So for example, in some counties, there were rape laws on the books that basically said black women could not be raped. So obviously it affects how women Black, particularly Black women behave um, and how they're treated. Um, also funding, funding has been woefully low when it comes to HIV um, in the Black community. Um, 
there was uh, an instance a couple of years ago, actually here in Atlanta, where um, the department, Fulton County Department of Health received millions of dollars, but it never got spent. And so the, that money went back to the government. So um, funding is extremely important. And, and oftentimes funding conversations, when they occur, we are not at that table. And this is very important. Um, other risk factors include incarceration, uh, not simply just incarceration of black women, but black men. So um, if you have black men who are being incarcerated at disproportionately high rates, that means that they are absent from the home. Their incomes are absent. Uh, their protection is absent. Um, also, um, the most of the HIV prevention models that were created are really based on, they're really male centered. Uh, so they don't necessarily take into consideration the nuances uh, that affect the lives of, of Black women. Um, and of course, you know, Georgia has no Medicare expansion. So even accessing uh, clinics that offer uh, services um, is, is very difficult. So when you take all of these things collectively, you can see how Black women and why Black women are at disproportionate risk. So what's missing from the existing HIV interventions? Um, and that's basically the Black lived experience. Most HIV prevention education efforts uh, are behavior-based because they're rooted in public health. So it makes sense that they focus on behavior. So uh, they're very uh, grounded in condom usage, number of partners, how frequently you have sex, which makes sense. But when we, when we reflect on some of those risk factors we just talked about, um, they're void of historical context and, uh, and cultural context. So for example, when we look at the black female body, the over 400 years of being in this country, um, it doesn't, these interventions don't take into consideration things like enslavement. Um, they don't take into consideration things like rape laws. They don't take into consideration things like forced sterilization. Um, also, um, and this one is also a very a sensitive issue, but there are also cultural values um, and experiences that affect black women's HIV risk. So in our own communities, there's black male patriarchy. There, uh, you have communities that, uh, black communities that suffer from violence. I mentioned before respectability politics and how that sometimes can cir circumvent conversations, honest conversations about sex and sexuality um, and childhood sexual abuse. Um, I remember in one of my, in one of my um, studies where I interviewed 50 women in the Atlanta area about the perceptions of, of, of their perceptions of living in their communities and how living in their communities affected their, their um, sexual experiences. And I uh, had the, uh, the great fortune of interviewing three families uh, that had multiple generations. So it, there was the grandmother, the mother and the granddaughter. And so in talking with them, it was very, very easy to see how patterns of abuse that had happened to the grandmother played out with the mother and the daughter and also affected their sexual decision-making. So that the role of community and families is very important. Um, another thing that um, is very prevalent, which there's, it's very hard to document um, is childhood sexual abuse. So in these, a lot of these women in this study um, talked about, the grandmothers talked about 
um, experiencing childhood sexual abuse um, and not being able to necessarily do anything about it. That's where the, the black male patriarchy comes into place. So then you have women who learn to adapt in these situations, but over time, sometimes adaptation becomes maladaptive. So for example, you might have a case where, um, well, this happened in a, in a couple of the studies, or um, sorry, in a couple of the interviews where the daughter had witnessed her, her mother being abused and in, in some cases would become very aggressive and protective, which was behavior she carried into, or they carried into their own personal relationships or they might become very, very overprotective um, of their children. So the issue of intergenerational trauma and how that plays a role in HIV is also not well explored. So um, one thing before I go on to the next one that I think is, is important to note, in one of the studies that I, I did, um, they conducted HIV prevention education with a group of women over time. And they followed up with these women immediately after the intervention, three months, six months, nine months, and 12 months. And when we concluded the study with focus groups, we learned that the, the women were least likely, these were all black women, they over time dissipated in the use of the prevention information they um, were given in, in the project. So basically they were taught to use condoms, how to negotiate condom usage, um, how to talk to partners about um, sex, things like that. But over time, they, their practice diminished. And in our focus groups, what we learned was that it really wasn't their choice. They wanted to be in relationship with these men and it was the men, their partners who weren't willing to wear condoms over time or blame them. And um, if they didn't want to use them, alluded to being involved with somebody else. So it also creates um, issues in terms of relationships. So, um, and the research also supports this as well. So when I looked at a meta-analysis of how effective these prevention education strategies or approaches are for black women, typically because they want to be in relationship with black men and the ratio of men to women um, makes it easier for men to just be with somebody else. And so it was the threat of losing their partner that made them um, stop using the practices that they were told. So, um, all of this leads to the issue or led me to, the, to consider the, the, the importance of creating an African-centered approach to HIV and AIDS in our communities, having, to have a, having a framework that really takes into consideration um, our historical and cultural issues. So um, several years ago, um, I was given this book called Decolonizing Methodologies by Asa Hilliard. And decolonizing, the full title is Decolonizing Methodologies, Research and Indigenous Peoples. And it was written by Linda Smith, who is um, a, a researcher in Auckland, New Zealand. And basically she talks about the role of imperialism and colonialism in research and how in Western cultures um, that imperialism and colonialism 
is perceived to be inextricably tied to research. So ultimately, our own agendas of how we go about engaging in research have a very um, deeply seated Western mindset. And so um, she talks about the importance of, of using our own indigenous knowledge. Um, so in her book, she has a, a, a framework for how do we, for helping us to center ourselves indigenous communities in our own research agenda, in our own practice. And I teach research methods and it was very um, uh, enlightening to me. So I took her framework and I applied HIV prevention education to this framework. And so now I'm gonna share with you how that looks. So, this is her framework and what you see filled in here is um, issues related to HIV prevention education. So let me share with you first the what she calls are the tides and the tides are survival on the outside, recovery followed by development and then self-determination. Um, then you have, once you get to self-determination, then there are questions that come up around issues of healing, decolonization, transformation, and ultimately mobilization. So looking at this framework in the context of HIV prevention education, I, I identified how HIV prevention education occurs. So if we look at survival at the outer ring, those would be strategies that only involve abstinence. So for example, under the Bush administration, um, they would only support HIV education um, that was abstinence-based. So just say no, don't do it um, as a survival strategy. Um, if we're going to, if once you get past survival only um, approaches, then we get to the point of recovery. So we know a little bit more about something. Actually, if we have a, um, a good example of this right now, uh, we could use this framework as we talk about the, the impact of COVID-19. So remember when COVID first um, uh, hit our shores here in, in North America, everybody was trying to figure out what is this? How do we deal with this? And so some of the survival strategies were stay in the house, wash your hands, wear a mask. So that would be akin to this. So in looking at HIV, when we know a little bit more, we found out that barrier methods were important. So that would be a condom approach uh, where you're disseminating condoms. So it was very popular in the eighties to go to clubs and pass out condoms. And you'll always see them at at clinics. Um, well, now we know a little bit more about HIV. And so we're in the, we're, we're in the development stage. Um, so you have approaches that um, are specific to some communities, um, the trans community, the LGBT community, um, but these uh, approaches oftentimes lack historical context. So they're still rooted in dealing with behavior. Ultimately, as a social worker, um, I want my clients to achieve self-determination. And there's no model for this in HIV prevention education. What does self-determination look like in the Black community? It looks like Black families, scholars, artists, and practitioners who define without judgment our own sexual behavior and practice affirming non-harmful acts of self-love. So when we define for ourselves our bodies and how we want to express ourselves, um, 
we have reached that point of self-determination. So once we, if that is our goal, then we will have more liberatory practices around sex and sexuality. So in moving to the next stage of Smith's model of decolonizing, once we know we want to get to, we're trying to get to self-determination, how do we approach healing? Where has harm happened around um, our um, understanding sex and sexuality in our communities? So when we look through the lens of healing, we collectively look at our history as enslaved Africans and how that experience has shaped and misshaped our contemporary sexual practices and beliefs. Um, and that causes you as a researcher to raise other questions. So I'm no longer just asking my um, research participants or clients about condom usage and sexual, how many sexual partners there have. I'm asking them, how has um, sex, how have they discussed sex in their homes, um, in their schools? Um, how do these practices and, and beliefs, how have they caused them harm? Um, so for example, there was a documentary called The Souls of Black Girls came out several years ago. And in the documentary, they interview these young black girls about how they feel about their bodies. And most of them said they did not feel positively about their bodies. It could be skin color, it could be hair. Um, they were more influenced by the media images that they were seeing. So that's an example of where, um, uh, not to be funny, uh, where sexual healing needs to occur. Um, the next lens is decolonization. So how then do we start to deconstruct some of these harmful images and ideas. So here we have to deal with myths of oppression. Um, and some of those myths are, um, we believe unprotected sex equates to love. If you love me, why would you ask me to wear a condom? Um, you don't trust me. Uh, the myth that blacks are more promiscuous. And there we have like the, the, the trope of the Jezebel, right? and men as, as being studs for breeding. So these are ways in which those harmful ideas and notions affect how we see ourselves and how we behave in relationship. Um, so once we've addressed healing and decolonization, we can start to move to a point of transformation. How do we now move on to better practices, healthier practices. Um, some of it is reclaiming the myths and reconstructing realistic roles um, about our relationships. So for example, um, a lot of us grew up um, with the images of, of the Disney characters, right? Um, and in the, the typical Disney story, there's a, there's a prince, he's going to come and sweep you off your feet. This translates into modern society as I'm gonna marry a man who's wealthy. Um, he's going to be able to pay for everything. He'll take me on trips. And we see this kind of idea played out in social media and some of our shows that we watch on television. And the reality is Black people don't make as much money as our white counterparts. So the idea that we are holding our partners to really a very, almost an impossible standard. So we have to then reclaim these ideas and decide what makes sense for us um, in the context of the lives that we live. And then finally, the, the last lens that, um, 
Smith talks about is mobilization. So having looked at what needs to be healed, looking at uh, uncolonizing, decolonizing our ideas about sex and sexuality and creating new ones, we can start to mobilize and advocate for ourselves. Um, based on the, the data I presented earlier, um, HIV rates are declining, but we are still the most affected group, meaning Blacks. So being able to advocate for ourselves and create meaningful programs and ways of assessing them becomes very, very important. So this is less a, um, it's a, a tool, a way to help us center the HIV conversation in our lives, in our lived experiences as Black people in this country. So an example of, of implementing what Smith talks about, I experienced several years ago at a conference here in Atlanta, it was called the Paradigm Shift Conference. And um, they had two meetings, one in 2017 and one in 2019. And the conference was spearheaded by Gail Wyatt, who's at UCLA, and Cynthia Davis, who is at uh, Drew Hospital, um, both in um, Los Angeles, California. And it was the first conference I had attended on HIV where Black women were at the center of the conversation. Uh, rather being pushed to the margins of, of other people's conversations. So it was centered on black women, which means we had black cisgendered, which means um, you are, if you identify as cisgendered, you identify with um, the gender you were born with at birth or trans women. So this was the first time you had Black women who were who operated at all stages of the HIV conversation. You had researchers, you had medical doctors, you had um, practitioners, people who are out in the field doing grassroots efforts, you had advocates. And we all talked about HIV and how we were affected. And it was extremely um, empowering. We talked about our work, we shared our networks. Um, I'm hoping that they're able to have another conference soon. Um, and one of the other things that, that came out of the conversations was how important it is to have a seat at the table, particularly when it comes to funding around HIV. Um, some of those sisters who were in the room who uh, uh, worked around funding issues spoke to how glaringly absent we are when policy funding decisions are made around HIV. So in terms of recommendations for moving forward, I th think anyone who's concerned with this issue of HIV in our communities, that we really have to advocate for race and gender prevention education awareness. And we have to get involved in, in local decisions around HIV. Um, it's not easy. I have been trying to um, get on some of these email lists and get invited to some of these um, conversations when they're making fund funding decisions, but um, it's, uh, it's been challenging. Um, also, recommendations around practice. Um, during that conference, I met a lot of women who are doing work that is complementary um, to my own. And before that moment, I felt like um, I was kind of in this alone. Like there's an elephant and we're all touching different parts of the elephant. And oftentimes we're not aware of each other, but these networks and individuals exist, but we have to be very um, uh, adamant about finding them and, and being involved, because it makes a difference. Um, also education. Um, what I'm hoping comes out of the research that I've done and the research that others have done is that we're able to 
bring this, our conversations, these conversations around history and culture um, to HIV prevention education um, and practice. Um, I think it will give us a better sense of, rather than looking at the individual behavior, but understanding that HIV um, is, it happened in a certain context. Our sexual history happened in a certain context. And that context cannot be separated from what we are experiencing now. And um, hopefully by knowing and understanding our place in that context, we can move forward. And that's it. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Well, Dr. Davis. Uh, that was a very informative and excellent presentation. Um, and I'm going to ask those folks who are viewing it to give you virtual applause at this time <laughs> to acknowledge you. And we, we definitely salute uh, this tremendous research and also the prescriptions that you've proposed. We actually had... Uh, a few questions as you were presenting. And I'm, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to present you the questions and hear your responses. Uh, first, first question that came in, actually are two together, is, and you answered this somewhat, why does the South have a high concentration of HIV? And I know you mentioned uh, about the level uh, that the South has structural racism, homophobia, and transphobia. And I was, um, so to follow up to that question is even, does uh, the South have a higher level of structural racism, homophobia, and transphobia than other regions of the United States? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily higher, but we know that the South is very conservative in terms of religious beliefs, and um, when you look at other places that have high rates of HIV, like New York or California, these tend to be more liberal leaning states. And there tends to be more efforts around awareness and education. Whereas in the South, um, because of conservative ideology, because of religious beliefs, people simply don't talk about it. And it gets back to also the, the, that notion of respectability politics. Um, so we see a lot of, of that inability to address the issue. So um, in thinking back to the map that I showed you of, of Atlanta, where you have high concentration of HIV, it could be that you have people who are moving to Atlanta who, have access to greater services. Um, Cause we know in rural areas um, it's even worse. So I think it, it really has to do with that whole Bible belt in large part. And, and, and I'm just thinking of it myself. I know the South is, is the greatest area of black concentration and also with the history of slavery and Jim Crow and, and now the new Jim Crow, we, we, we you know, it's the highest uh, concentration of those systems that oppressed us. So I'm, I'm wondering if there's an interrelationship there, but we that's something I think uh, we have to pursue. Uh, one question that came up, you talked about funding and lack of funding being uh, one of the issues. Um, who determines what funding is available and, and who determines how it's used once it is available? Hmm. Um, so it was very interesting at um, the last uh, conference, Shifting the Paradigm Conference I, I attended in 2019, I had the honor of sitting next to um, a sister who, um, she's a medical doctor, and uh, she was with the Fulton County um, Department of Health. 
And um, she, she was the one who spoke, she was actually on the panel as well. Um, she spoke to the issue of funding. A lot of the funding comes from the federal government. And that funding uh, then is typically disseminated to uh, departments of health. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, is the Depar- it is the Department of Health, the Departments of Health, um, at least here in, in Atlanta, uh, that makes these decisions. And those decisions are typically from their, decided by their advisory boards. Um, and she was very candid in saying that there aren't a lot of black people who are sitting at those tables, which means there's nobody to speak up on behalf of communities that, um, that are really in dire need of, of funding and support. And that was one of the, that was another question that was raised. You talked about um, being able for us to sit at the table or create our own tables. What does creating our own tables look like? Um, I think it looks like actively one seeking the other people, seeking out those individuals that are doing the the same work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. And you almost have to be a detective, you know? So every time like I pick up an article um, that's uh, in my wheelhouse, I'll write down an individual's name. I will will try to contact them. I'm currently working on a a HIV project with um, the ITC, the Interdenominational Theological Center here in Atlanta. And we're working with churches and um, we are trying to identify innovative programs that are out there. And some of these programs, um, uh, there is existing funding, actually Gilead Sciences is funding our project, but they have funded several other HIV projects. So they've already created networks. So I've contacted some of those people and we've been sharing resources. So sometimes it's just really doing the grunt work of writing the names down of the articles, um, following people. I found that the, the, the people in the HIV community are very generous with their resources and time. So, um, so for example, uh, some of those maps that I showed you earlier are produced by AIDSview. And um, I contacted them uh, to help us generate some maps for that HIV project at ITC. At, and it, it doesn't cost anything. Um, so it really is doing that detective work, I think. And it almost sounds like the conference you mentioned, uh, the Paradigm Shift Conference, that it needs to be more vehicles like that to bring together some of these folks that you talked about so that a network can be organized. So I, you know, I'm thinking of Marcus Garvey talked about the, uh, the importance of organization and, and so if we want to create our own tables. We have to bring all of our elements to the uh, common table to have a, 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 a self-determining strategy around this. I, I, so. That's it. Yes. Uh, here, here's an, another question that came up in your presentation. You talked about um, one of the issues, particularly as it regards to Black women and girls, is that many of the prevention models were male-centered. And so uh, for our students, how do we distinguish a male-centered model from a female-centered model or a gender-balanced model? How do we, how is that distinguished? Um, so, I think it is in part, so for example, um, when I did those interviews with the 50 women, um, it was talking to them about their experiences that gave me insight into uh, how they were perhaps experiencing um, some, of, uh, some, of these, these, some of these risk factors that are specific to women. So for example, I remember 
interviewing this one young woman and um, she had a, a, a young child and um, it, was, it wasn't until the end of the interview that she confided in me that um, she had been raped by her, um, her aunt's husband. And she initially said she was going to keep the information to herself, but she was always in his presence, right? We come to the house, family meetings, things like that. And um, she couldn't take it anymore. So she decided that she was going to tell her aunt what happened and she did. And when she told her aunt, the aunt denied it. The aunt said, you're lying. He didn't do that. Why would you say that? And then in turn, the aunt contacted the girl's mother, her sister. And her mother said the same thing. And they told her that if she told anybody else, she was going to be endangering their family. Child Protective Services could come, remove the children, things like that. So that's a very gendered response, a female response. So going back to um, things like childhood sexual abuse, again, understanding, I, I don't think there's any way we could really learn it other than really one, looking at our own history. That's why I think history is very important in understanding how black women's bodies have been uh, uh, discussed. And there are lots of books out there on that. Um, Gail Wyatt wrote uh, Stolen, what's it called? Stolen, I think it's called Stolen Women. Um, and other people have written. So these are things we can educate ourselves on and, and find out, because I really don't know much about Black men's bodies in that way. But I think if we, we were to sit down and talk about the ways in which men have also experienced, I know they experience sexual abuse. They right. can, they're not immune from it. Right. But understanding their, um, how also patriarchy um, is, is handed down and how they experience it. So I think it begins with having conversations. Right, right. That, that, I was thinking the same thing. And conversations and um, you talked, you, you gave the example of uh, a young woman who's not believed in her own family. So we need also um, a safe space uh, 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 for those victims, right? Mm -hmm. Where they can be, uh, have some uh, support and someone to advocate for them. Um, and, you know, in that, you, you, you just gave an, an example, but you talked about in your presentation, you've talked about before intergenerational trauma. Um, what type of policy uh, implications does that suggest need to be implemented if we see that intergenerational trauma is playing a great impact on continued victimization of our yeah. black girls in particular? I think in, in having that information and knowing that that is a potential source of, 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 of harm that, especially in our communities, that when we are advocating for funding we do so recognizing that it's not just an individual that's impacted, but it could be a unit, it could be a family, it could be a community. And this is where traditional public health um, has not been very helpful because it is very much a, a individually based um, approach. So everything is um, focused on the individual, which means you're not, a, the other people who might be affected aren't included. So you're left with a singular solution like those women in that focus group who stopped using uh, safe sex practices because it interfered with their relationships with their partners. Right. So in having um, a more cultural and historically informed approaches to HIV, we're able to um, 
offer um, interventions that are really grounded in their reality and complement their lived experience. I appreciate that response. And uh, I think I have one final question that came in. And we're going to encourage people viewing if you have more questions to uh, put them down at the Auburn Avenue Research Library uh, Facebook page and social media, as well as the Department of Africana Studies Facebook. And, you know, Dr. Davis will follow up on the, these questions for you. But he, we have one final question. If people want to follow up and pursue this type of research and advocacy, where would you suggest they go? Um, I think starting with your local HIV service organizations, um, that's actually how I got my start. Um, I went to Aid Atlanta, which is here. In, in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, because I wanted to offer my evaluation services uh, uh, to them. And, um, and that's what started me on the path. Uh, they have your local organizations, first of all, they need services, they need support services, they need volunteers. Um, and um, it's a good way to learn what about what's happening in your local community. Uh, so that would be my first recommendation. Well, uh, Dr. Sarita Kaya Davis, uh, we appreciate you sharing your wealth of information, uh, your advocacy, your true scholar activism, uh, which you know our department prides itself on it. And I think you're a great example of that scholar activism. And we encourage, particularly if our students are listening, if you have interest in this topic and you know other folk in the community, reach out to Dr. Davis uh, yes. so we can build that table. That's right. <laughs> we can build that table uh, because you know this is an issue that affects our people. We say that Black Lives Matter. And of course, you know, our people who are suffering with this disease and people su suffering from uh, sexual abuse in our community. We have to build a table and we have to build a shelter for them. Uh, so Dr. Davis, thank you for doing this advocacy and doing this work on the path of our people, leading us to decolonization and self-determination. Dr. Emoja, thank you so much. I appreciate you for um, taking up the, the, the mantle and, and, and being the moderator uh, for this discussion. Um, it means a lot to me. I thank you so much. All right. Well, I know the check is in the mail. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Take care. And thanks again to Auburn Avenue Research Library for uh, giving us the space to have these conversations with our campus community as well as the community at large. Yes. Um, yes. Also. Thank also. you.